Now I'm going to give you a shortened uh, profile of Apostle Felix Moyo, uh, who is a Zimbabwe national, a teacher by profession, who taught in Zimbabwe from 1994 to 2002. He worked for the World Food Program till the time he left Zimbabwe in 2003 and relocated to Botswana, where he worked in the life insurance sector. He holds diplomas in education from the University of Zimbabwe, pastoral studies from Botswana Bible Training Institute, insurance practice from Insurance Institute of Zimbabwe. And he is currently enrolled for a degree in theology, counseling, and ministry with the Minnesota graduate of theology from the USA. Apostle Moyo left Botswana for South Africa in 2019 as an instruction of the Holy Spirit, where he opened a ministry in Hong Kong known as the Gospel the Gospel of Truth International Ministries, which he shepherds to date. Apostle Collins Moyo is a man who loves God, an educator and children. That is in short the short end profile of Apostle Collins Moyo. Ladies and gentlemen, may we welcome him to go up and walk around for a while. Thank you, O oh Lord, mighty Jehovah, that your word cuts 
even to the division of the bone and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. In the name of Jesus, thank you for your living word. May somebody's life be turned today because of your living word. May somebody today hear the voice not of a man, but the voice of the creator of the universe. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and we all say amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's step here for Jesus Christ. Thank you. Um, I'm deeply humbled today to be standing in front of you wonderful people. It is by the grace of God. It has nothing to do with me. It's something that I never dreamt one day to happen. But because God is a God of order. I want to appreciate uh, this opportunity. We want to appreciate and thank God for your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. We also have some elders from our ministry that are in our midst. We also want to thank God for their lives and to acknowledge their presence here in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And the people that are causing us to gather today, the two beautiful and wonderful people that are here are also elders in our ministry. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, we want to appreciate all the servants of God that are here. I humble myself before your grace and I would want to thank God that may he continue to use you mightily, may he continue to prosper you in all things and the mission of the Spirit of God that is upon your lives. Hallelujah. And also to welcome everybody, children of God and those that are here to celebrate with those that are celebrating. I would want to enter straight into the word of God. I would want us to hear God not only with our two ears. But let us hear God with four ears, two ears of the spirit and two ears that are physical. Because somebody today, God is speaking into your life. I may not know you today, but I can tell you, God will speak into your life today. We are gathered as a special moment because these wonderful people, they are setting a pace. They have set a pace. They have given a challenge to our lives. When we hear of 31 years, of togetherness, of love and understanding, it is a challenge to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My wife also is, uh, we've been together for the past 21 years. And I would, uh, I would, I would, I would want to take up this challenge that uh, if it's 31 years the, the love is still burning, then I tell you, God must speak into our marriages today. Uh, hallelujah, somebody. So today I am having a title, Marriage God's Idea. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Men of God and woman of God, thank you so much for this beautiful occasion. We want to thank God for your lives. Hallelujah. May we open the word of God for those that have their Bibles, or phone Bibles probably. I would want to read two scriptures that I'm going to be talking about. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. And the first Peter chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Then we shall read first Peter 3, 5 to 6. You will see why these two scriptures, because they are addressing the two partners in a marriage. Hallelujah. Beginning with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave him. In himself for it. Hallelujah. And if we read First Peter chapter 3 from verse 5 to 6, it says, For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement, may the Lord bless the reading of his words. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I am here to talk about the challenge that the Twala family has thrown in front of us, especially us who are married, and of course those that are looking forward to marriages. Hallelujah. So nobody is spared today. Nobody is spared. So marriage is God's idea. Marriage begins with God and it needs God's presence. 
God is the one who defines marriage. Marriage is defined by God. It is not an end in wisdom. He has a, an understanding of what he called marriage. Because to begin with, although it looks like it starts with two people, it is still God's idea. Glory be to Jesus Christ. So we must have the voice of God speaking over every marriage. A marriage that does not have the voice of God speaking in it, it becomes a disaster. Glory be to Jesus Christ. We are reading here from the, from the book of Ephesians. And we, are, we hear the Bible speaking to men. Men love your wives. And wives, they are told to submit. I want to say something about this. Why would God give a command that men must love their wives? It is because God understands that men don't love. This is why you find that even in the house of God, even in the kingdom of God, we have fewer men than women. Because men don't love easily. So God has to bring it as a commandment that men love your wives. Women were not commanded to love. Because God understands the heart of women. That they have so much love in it. In them. So God only asks them to submit to loving husbands. Glory be to Jesus. I remember one day I was listening to bachelors talking. Some young men who were talking. The other two had married. The other one was still single. And now he was busy cleaning and washing. The friends had visited him. So the friends are saying to him. Ah no 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 Muna. I think you must do something. Then he says, what? Then he says, no, I think there's the wife that is now needed in this house. And when I approached them and we were talking, they said, man of God, what do you think? And I said, what? They said, no, this man, he is saying, ah, no, I think there's a need, need for, a, for, a, for a woman in this house. And I said, why? Because he says, now there's too much washing and too much cleaning. And then I said, okay, if you want to wash dishes to be washed and clothes to be washed, go and buy washing machines. And dishwashing machines. Because you are, you are having a wrong idea of marriage. If you are going to be bringing a woman here for the purpose of washing, then it's a wrong idea of marriage. Glory be to Jesus. So what we are saying is we need to have the understanding of what God calls marriage. I want to be moving faster because I don't have a lot of time. Glory be to Jesus. There are two things that I call success. We have different definitions of success, but I have two definitions that I think are the most profound successes of life. Number one, it is one's relationship with Christ. If you succeed in your relationship with God, you are a successful person. The other second success, we measure it with how much you succeed in your marriage. Because we have so much big people, we have people that are making aeroplanes, we have people that are making phones, we have people that are sending the moon, the moon rockets to the moon, people that can think, scientists, people with advanced knowledge, they can do literally everything, but go and check on their marriages. A man that is called successful in business today, go home and check the disaster that is in his marriage. Hallelujah. Amen. Why are successful people in business, in science, in advanced knowledge, why are they failing in marriage? It is because they, have, they don't have an understanding of the idea of God about marriage. I hope I'm speaking to somebody. So it is a type of salvation. Hallelujah. That's why so many people are failing in it. Because already we have... 8 billion, close to 8 billion human beings on earth. And yet we have just almost 2 billion believers. The other 6 billion are all less because salvation is a difficult thing. That is exactly how difficult marriage is. Not so many people succeed in marriages. Most marriages that we can speak about today, they are battlefields. Where people are, where a wife is holding an AK-47. Ready to shoot. <laughs> and we still call marriage because men think marriage is a man and a woman sleeping together and staying in one house. And yet, when you find a man 
putting on a gum boot and placing it on the neck of a woman. And then people would call that a marriage. And somebody would call that a husband. That's a dissident. Because what is a husband according to the understanding of God who is the author of marriages? The Bible is telling us that as Christ has loved the church. So what did God do when he loved the church? The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world. But when he loved the world, what did he do? He gave. Which means love alone is not enough. People may think that they enter into marriage because they love each other. Let me correct you. Love alone is not enough. There are so many people who really loved each other, but they failed to stay together. And when they divorced, the wife went away weeping. The husband went into drunkenness. If you ask them, what is the problem? They will tell you, I loved my wife. But now, why are you not together? It is because love alone is not enough. Even God to the church, he decided that after I have loved the church, I still have to start giving. Glory be to Jesus. So I would want to talk about the give and take of marriages. There is something to give in every marriage. You don't just love. First of all, love is step number one. Then we enter into giving. What is it that must be given? I'm going to give faith in the marriage. So when you are coming into marriage, you are coming to give. Hallelujah. Number one, you give an ear. The Bible says his ear is not heavy. That he may not hear us. That's the relationship with, of God to the church. So a husband, a wife in marriage, the first thing you must also give is an ear to the partner. Communication. Hallelujah. I remember there was, a, there was an incident of a woman, a man and a woman who were angry with each other. And they decided not to speak to each other. And now when they were about to sleep now, they, they needed to say something to each other. The wife was too close to the husband. The husband was fed up. He wanted her to push over. So he took a piece of paper and he wrote, please move over. You are too close to me. You are irritating me. He gave to the wife. The wife also took another piece of paper and also wrote, buy another bigger bed. You are the husband. And so they were exchanging papers throughout the night. Then the husband was supposed to go for an interview. He was supposed to leave home at 6 o'clock. He writes a paper and says, wake me up at 6 o'clock. Gives to the wife. Then when he wakes up the following day, it was 8 o'clock. He says to the wife, I told you to wake me up at 6 o'clock. I missed the interview. The wife pointed. There was a paper written, wake up at 6 o'clock. Yeah. Hallelujah. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. So what are we saying? We need to have communication. We need to have a mature person in every argument. When there is an argument and a misunderstanding, there must be one person who becomes more mature there. Because if you both become babies, then that argument, it is going to end up over spilling into something else. Communication in marriages has broken so many marriages. Glory be to Jesus. The silent treatment, when you are angry with your wife, you are angry with your husband, then you decide, I'm not going to speak to him. Let me tell you, you are breathing a cancerous soul. It's a cancer. Silent treatment is not a solution. It is a cancer. Because it will develop into things that you never expected. So even if you are so angry, even if you are so bitter, you still need to come back to the table and sit down and talk to each other. No matter how painful and how painful it could be, we still need. Christ would still love the church. No matter how many sins we commit, yet he still loves us. Hallelujah, somebody. Number two, self-control. The spirit of love, of, 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 of peace, and of a kind of, of, of self-control. We must have self-control. So if you, can, you are able to control yourself in any marriage, you are able to withdraw from explosive situations. When you see that things are getting out of hand, as the husband, you see that the wife is boiling, you have to get out. Get out of your car, take a drive. Go somewhere else, refresh your mind, and come back home later. Somebody must withdraw when fire begins. 
But the problem is we have two babies who are staying together. This one would say, I will not, I will not budge. The other one say, I, I will not budge. Too. And at the end of the day, it goes out of control. So when we have self-control, we know even what to speak, what to say. How do you speak to your husband? What do you say to your wife when you want to communicate? The other woman was angry with the husband. And started saying, you're a dog. You're a very big dog. A big one. A good dog. And the husband kept quiet. He said, okay, you call me a dog. Yeah, you're a dog. Then he kept quiet. He slept. Tomorrow in the morning, the wife had forgotten that she was supposed to go for some beauty. What do you call those? Those spas are where you go and you know, beautify yourself. And the husband had promised a thousand rand to the wife. Now the wife wakes up and she says to the husband, hey, I have to go. The husband kept quiet. Hey, hey, hey. Remember, give me that thousand. I have to go. The husband continued to look at him. At him. Hey, 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 wake up. The husband said, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. What is it? You need one thousand dollars from a, one thousand rand from a big dog. We are forgetting that life still has to continue tomorrow. We will still need to each other, even if we are angry with each other today. Yeah. It's not the end of the world. Life has to proceed. Life has to continue. So we must be able to solve problems. Problem solving is a weakness in marriages, and the husband ends up becoming a big dog, and he backs back at you. And when you speak and you call your husband a big dog, when he starts following every woman, like what dogs do in the, in the location, you must not blame anyone. Because there is power in the words that we speak. Yeah. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Amen. We must be able to resist the devil. Control, self-control. When you find a man moving out of the home and sleeping out there, do you know that men are so weak? We are so weak. We are so weak that if we fail to control ourselves, men, let us not trust our flesh. Our flesh will betray us. Yeah. Let me tell you, a man who started an extramarital affair, it just came from a prostitute. And the prostitute just said, ah, you joke with me, you think I'm your wife. Myself, I will kill you in bed. He just felt so challenged that he said, no, you, you, you mean me. You can kill me in bed. Just want to prove that, no, 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 you can't, you can't say that to me. It is like this is the styles of the devil. He comes in different ways, looking for him who he might devour. Hallelujah. Amen. An angry wife. At one point, when she was angry with the marriage, she wanted to go. She said, told her husband, I'm fed up. I am going. She carried six suitcases, went somewhere to stay. As she was there. The husband ended up now phoning her and consoling her. Okay, come back home. By the time she realized, she woke up. Okay, I have to go back home. She told the husband, please bring the cars for the, for, the, for the bags. But the day that she was angry, she carried six suitcases. But when she is sober, she does not even know how she carried them. <laughs> when we are driven by emotions, we do things that we can't even be able to understand. How did you carry the six suitcases alone the day you were angry and lived in the house? Now you want me to bring a car. Yeah. Hallelujah. Self-control. Number three, we need to exercise forgiveness. The Bible says, for he has forgiven us. Yeah. Christ has forgiven the church. The problem that we are having in marriages, some marriages of people that are here, is because you are carrying bags of wrongs. Every, and each and every one, the husband has got a suitcase of the wrongs of the wife. The wife has got six suitcases. So when a small thing starts, they now start to say, okay, okay, I oh, open the bag. You, you did this in January 2015. Yeah. And the wife says, oh, you think that is enough? Okay, she opened the suitcase. What about you? What on, on, in July you did this? In August you did this? Okay, in December you did this. So each one is carrying a bag of wrongs. Am I talking to somebody here? Bags of wrongs, bottled bitterness is the cancer that is in marriages. Because people are carrying heavy loads in the marriage. You are failing to forgive. You are failing to forgive. And the issue that happens now, when you see a wife now being beaten in the home and she runs out wearing a, 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 the suit of Eve. 
and the whole location is watching. How can somebody leave the house naked like you? And then when you go there, you want to try and find out what has happened. They will tell you that the story started from the remote control. Remote control? No, no, it can't be. They said, yeah, it was about remote control because he wanted to watch Arsenal. I wanted to put the God channel. So the wife put uh, God channel. The husband took Arsenal. God channel. Arsenal. God channel. And two somebody is flying out of the house. Now when you look at the remote, the remote cannot cause such a problem. But now what is happening is there is a bottled anger. People are carrying things. People have got bags of wrongs. They are just waiting for something that a matchstick that just ignites the fire. And all hell will break loose. I hope I'm speaking to somebody right now. I know of some people that are angry and still living with each other. Yet they are so angry with each other to the point that even when the husband is sleeping, the wife would peep into the blanket and look at him and say, Hey, where did this Raina come from? How many people are really asking themselves, How? What had I smoked the day I met this animal? And yet the day that you met, oh, it was so romantic, oh, sweet, sweet, my love, my sugar, my, 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 skorogoro and my everything. Because management is what is lacking. Management of character, of behavior, managing feelings, being able to let the past go by. Hallelujah. Are we going to be able to get to this? And how many of us will be able to get to this? 31 years and still the fire burns. 31 years and it still looks like a marriage of people that are 25 and 23. This is a great challenge to somebody. Glory be to Jesus Christ. God says, I will never rem remember your sins. He forgives us and He forgets. And yet, man does not want to forget what the wrongs of the other person has done. Glory be to Jesus. Number four, submission to one another. The Bible is talking about submission. Submission is not oppression. These are two different things. It's not oppression. Wives are supposed to submit. Wives are supposed to be wives, not lies. Because some men, they have knives, not wives in their homes. When the Bible says the man is the head, the wife wants to become the neck. That turns around that head. He is the head of the house. And the women, we are there as supporters. We are like the Holy Spirit. When Eve was brought to Adam, she represented the Holy Spirit, the helper. A helper is not to be oppressed, it's supposed to be a partner. Hallelujah, somebody. Number five, fulfillment of responsibilities. Re fulfillment. The other crisis that is in marriage is people have abandoned their responsibilities. The wife has forgotten who she is. The husband has long forgotten who he is. Now there is a crisis of roles in the marriage. And because of that, now the wife has turned into the husband. And the, wife, the husband does not want to turn into the wife. If we are men in the homes, let us provide. That's our duty. Provide for the family. Yeah. Hallelujah. Provide. There are people right now that are listening to me that are staying together because of children. You hear, what can I do, my friends? Because, hey, what about the children? So they are now married to children. The marriage is gone. You are not, you, you, you left that marriage long back. You are just there because your children are there. I thank God for this silence. It means something to me. <laughs> Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Women cook for your husbands. Smartness. Smartness. At times we run away from debt. I always tell people of women who can enter the bedroom and they want to take off the skirt and even the underwear. They remove it there and it falls there and they jump out of it. They go. When you come and you look at the skirt, you can tell the direction that this person was facing. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody? Amen. And you find men disappearing. Men who run away from that. And now when men go to that small mkuku, where Susan is, yeah. 
So then we'll start to take camphor and start smearing the men from under the feet, going up. And yet when your husband comes and asks for food, you tell him, you can't you see the food. <laughs> now when they go to Mukuku, you find a man with an expensive Mercedes Benz who stays in Sentin. He goes to Alexandra and he sleeps in a Mukuku where even his legs can't fit there outside. You need even a red cloth to tie to and write abnormal load. Why is this man running away from a mansion and sleeping in a mukuku? Because there is something happening in that mukuku which is not happening in a center. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Women rights don't necessarily mean that we, we, women must abandon their roles. It's not there in the Bible. Show me a scripture that talks about it. We are there to support each other. We are there to submit to one another. We are there to respect each other, to maintain our roles. The thing that you are calling a troublesome marriage is not a problem marriage at all. There is somebody who is causing it, and it's you. If you go back today and become the man that you are supposed to be in that marriage, or the woman you are supposed to be in that marriage, you will discover that there is nothing that is rocky about that marriage at all. Am I speaking to somebody? As I am finishing, I want to talk about two things, people of God. The other disease of marriage is evil company. Who are your friends? When you have trouble with your marriage, who are you speaking to? Yeah. Men would agree in a beer where are today when you get home, I know what, one get home and beat our wives. Yeah. Beat them, whoever one has to beat their wife. And they agree. How can you how, how can you wash plates when your wife is there? Ah, where did you marry? I don't do that. You don't do that in your own marriage. In my own marriage, myself, I clean the house. I, can you hear Mom saying, mm-hmm? Yeah, you know, you know, men of God, when we preach, we must people must listen to our wives. Because the times the things that we are preaching in front of people, look at the mom roots. We see my brother saying, eh, hey, you. <laughs> but when you hear her saying, Amen, Amen, it means it's happening. Yeah. I make the bed in my bedroom. She really makes the bed. I clean, I mop the house, the whole house. I clean the toilet, the bathroom, everything. Myself. Is it because I am married to her or she married me? Like uh, I'm talking, if I talk in English, it's correct. But in our local languages, marrying someone is you taking him or taking her as some property. Yeah. But that is not what God's idea about marriage. Yeah. The people that you are telling your problems are the same people that are fueling your problems in your marriage. Yeah. If you have friends that are giving you counsel over the problems of your marriage, listen to what they are saying. Oh, yes. A married woman, you have six friends who have divorced. And those are your friends. You don't want to leave them. Ah, oh, you can choose friends for me. I have a right to choose my own friends. But they are abandoning their husbands. Evil company corrupts good morals. Don't just tell everybody about the problems of your marriage. It's not everybody who dares to hear what is happening in your marriage. Whatever advice that comes to us, we must weigh it in the standard of God's word. What does God say about this? We must allow God to speak. Somebody today who is in this place. The Bible says when, the, when King Uzziah died, that is Isaiah, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. The death of Uzziah caused Isaiah to see the Lord. Today, somebody because of the anniversary of the twilight, your marriage is going to be restored. I am looking for people today who are here, your wife is here, your husband is here. Please lift up your hands. This is my last thing that I'm doing now. If your wife is here and your husband is here, lift up your hands. Couples, please lift up your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Please go to it. Go to it. This is my last thing that I'm doing now. We want to pray for a revival of your marriage. Whatever that the devil is planning against your marriage, it will not prosper in the name of Jesus. Today there is an anointing of restoration of marriage. There is an anointing of receiving marriages 
for somebody. You may think it is about the dollars. No, God does not just do one thing. He is filling this whole room for the, with the grace of marriage. If you are here, you are believing God for a marriage, I want you to receive by the time I pray. If you are married already, I want you to stand up with your wife. There's something that we want to do, something special. Stand up. If you are far away from here, I'm going to come. What do you have? What do you have? I'm seeing very wonderful couples. But behind these beautiful and wonderful faces, there are AK 47 and a few guns and grenades that are lying somewhere. And today we want to get rid of those ones. I want you to face your wife or face your husband. Face your wife, face your husband. Look at each other. You can't be shy to look at each other. How did you see each other from day one? Don't worry, that's your wife. Marriage is grace. Marriage is grace. Somebody whose face looks like a dolphin is married. And somebody who looks like an angel is still praying for a man. It's not about the beauty. It's about the grace of God. If you look at how happy is married, even now you want What was he looking at? It's grace. You may think you can hear of one, it's a, it's, a, it's a passport to marriage. Forget about it. Beauty is sending young women into marriage, but character is sending them very warm, very quickly. Look at your wife. I want you to speak to your wife. You speak to your husband. Tell your husband, tell your wife, I love you. Forgive me for anything I have done. Let the past be the past. Today we are starting a new day. In the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want you to kiss your wife and the happy. Thank you.